Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this panel is on the future of OpenStack networking, and I have a number of very distinguished guests here tonight to be talking about this or this afternoon. Um, there are still a few seats up here in the front if you want to, um, to make yourself available. Yes. Okay. So as all of you know, and because you're here, obviously, that, that Neutron networking has, big, has been a major innovation that OpenStack has done in terms of separating out, and probably the first time we've seen networking as a service created. So in many ways, it may have been a rocky road as we've tried to sort of refactor Nova, take networking out into its own service, but it, it follows a fundamental design principle that we have in OpenStack, which is that we're designing a platform that's a set of loosely coupled but aligned services. And so what we've really been doing in, in networking is taking that out so that we can really, first of all, foremost, keep up with the changes that are happening in networking, uh, but then also really allow you people who are really the experts in networking to participate in something, applying your own expertise. So with that, I wanted to have the panelists actually introduce themselves first, and then we've got a couple of questions, and we will have, we have mics set up here as well, so if you have questions you want to pose to the panel, just walk up to the mic, and I will recognize you, and we can proceed. So Kyle, why don't you start off? Uh, hello, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Mestri. I work at Cisco, and I'm the OpenStack Neutron PTL. Uh, I've been working on, this is actually my seventh OpenStack Summit, so I've been involved with this for quite a while at this point. And my name is Dan Condi. I'm a director of products at Mitocora, and uh, we're a network virtualization company, and this is um, my second OpenStack Summit. Hi, my name is uh, Neil Swart. Um, I work at a company called Plexi. We do data center network uh, solutions. Um, doing biz devy things and what we really like are abstractions to drive our optical fabric. Um, and one of the reasons to be here is um, abstractions and policy. Hi, I'm Chris Wright. I'm the technical director for software defined networking and network functions virtualization at Red Hat. I love networking. I'm excited about what Neutron could be and uh, this is a great place to talk about that. So. Okay, yeah, so, so where I wanted to sort of start off the conversation was that um, it's not, Neutron networking is actually a couple of years old, so let's take stop, stock of what we've done and particularly talk about some of the more recent changes that we've taken place in terms of the ML2 and how we've handled plugins. So who wants to take that off? Chris, do you want to start on that? Uh, so Neutron, or formerly Quantum, started off as a project whose goal was to provide a network abstraction to tenants to uh, allocate and manage their network resources. And as uh, it started, it was really just uh, a set of APIs around a couple of, of plugins. And at Red Hat, we were looking at how are we actually going to take this and put it into production. One of the key things we saw was we work with our customers in very, heter very heterogeneous environments. And having a single monolithic plugin was something that wasn't going to work well for, for our customers. Um, so w we started down a path of, of looking at how can we bring uh, the ability to plug multiple different technologies into Neutron at one, at one time with a project that ultimately became ML2 and now is for, uh, a very core project to Neutron. And uh, what I think is really important about that, the, the lesson that, that I think is an important takeaway is where you can bring uh, more and more core functionality into the core Neutron service and allow the plugins to be uh, more like d drivers that are really trying to do as little as possible. You get common code reuse, you get tested, well understood code paths. And um, you know, initially when we started where something was really just a wrapper around a couple of different plugins, it was not nearly as, as powerful as it is now. Yeah, I could say that another interesting thing is it started off being just a layer two connectivity and, and I think the goal is to actually look forward and say that you want to add a lot more higher level services uh, to allow people to have a much fuller experience in networking. If You could have taken the argument and say let's just keep it at a lower level and, and be pure, but I think the whole point is to just move forward as well. So I think having higher level functions and things like policy is very important. So I think it's best to be forward looking and add more functionality and also as, uh, as Chris said, to add a lot of uh, capabilities to add multiple vendors to collaborate in it as well. 
Um, yeah, and I think the uh, sort of to resonate what uh, what Dan just mentioned um, as a uh, as a company that's basically started on the foundation of pretty much everyone else in the networking industry, we looked at every Neutron plugin out there and looked at, you know, should we implement the same type of mechanism to steer an entire infrastructure underneath, or can we move the ball forward by taking a more abstract approach uh, in looking at what, what is necessary, what is the intent of that infrastructure underneath? Um, and we started down a path uh, inside of Open Daylight, and now we're looking actively in, in Neutron as well, uh, to figure out, can we leverage a higher layer abstraction and use that to drive the infrastructure underneath rather than having to resort back to things we've known for 20 years? So instead of going down to CLI or going to a NetConf equivalent, can we stay a little bit higher up so that we can take that intent, compute paths around it, and drive an infrastructure? So I think that having this hybrid approach that uh, Chris also mentioned is absolutely crucial because you cannot go from... Uh, legacy infrastructure to new SDN infrastructure as one big bang. Uh, and that kind of alludes as well to the challenges we have with, with Nova Compute Networking or Nova Networking and going and pulling that into net Neutron. So I think we'll learn a lot uh, as we go along, but abstractions are what we think is the world, you know, what brings the world around. So, so I think one of the things that, that's worth mentioning as well, and people alluded to it, was um, the abstractions in Neutron really allow for innovation from both vendors as well as open source plugins. There's actually a talk right after this where we're going to discuss all of the different open source implementations uh, that, that back the Neutron APIs as well. So there, there's actually a lot of innovation going on in, in all areas here as well. So actually, Kyle, I'd like to ask you, since you're Kyle's newly elected uh, PTL now for this, so um, moving forward, we have a very diverse set of participants uh, and contributors in, in the community today. Um, a lot of uh, issues have always been around there's not enough people to do reviews, that we're, that it's taking too long to get changes in there. Uh, how, how are we going to address that this next year or this coming year? So, that, so that, that's a really good question, actually. Thanks for putting me on the spot there. But, <laughs> so so I, I think what it comes down to ultimately is you have to, you have to think of OpenStack as, as a community, and it was alluded to during the keynotes this morning as well. So you know, you, you, you're going to get out of it what you put into it as well. So what, what I'd like to see as PTL is, is, is all of the new participants, whether they're vendors or operators or whatever, uh, contributing back, you know, doing reviews, uh, getting involved with the project and things like that. I think that's the best way. That's the best way to get involved, and that's the best way that we can help to scale it uh, for the Juno development cycle and forward. Actually, it would be, be good to hear from other panelists again. What are your own objectives for what you want to see accomplished in in this next time frame? I have a comment. I think it's really important to have the users being involved as well, because admittedly, there's a very strong vendor bias and how it was developed. But if you look at things like uh, LBAS, a lot of the things that ultimately matter are how the users as tenants or people who manage the tenants understand you know, how to make the networking work for them. Now, that doesn't mean that we want to ignore the infrastructure side as well, which is equally important, but I think having the balance for the end users as well as the infrastructure side is really critical looking at Neutron in the future. So, so actually, that, that brings up a great point because uh, LBAS is actually one of the areas where we've seen an influx of operators and users recently. And it's actually been great to get a lot of, a lot of that involvement because we're th seeing things like use cases being set up. And it's great to s hear from people who are actually deploying this at scale, like what, what the pain points are, what the challenges are, and what they'd like to see going forward. So it would be great to get that sort of involvement across the project uh, in other areas as well. So uh, what I would like to see happen over the next short period of time in, in Neutron development is to make Neutron deployable. Uh, just usable, nothing complicated, just make it scale, make it robust, make it functional. Because when we're talking to uh, end users, their biggest pain point is often in the networking deployment part of how do you set, stand up a cloud. Uh, I think that that's an achievable goal. Uh, it's really not too lofty to say let's, con let's focus on core stability and core functionality. And while features are important, and there are a few key features that I hear over and over again from talking to users, uh, you know, I, think, I think it builds a nice prioritized list of where, where can this development community put their uh, focus. And I, I really do think 
admitting that we need to focus on some core quality and, and a user-centric point of view or operator-centric point of view is, is a critical part of that. Um, I can only add, only add to that that the user side of it has long been under-highlighted in a lot of ways in the networking industry. Um, if you see the, the current trend of sort of standardization bodies that used to have a lot of involvement from operators and from telecom companies that uh, is, is dwindling a little bit, so less people, less end users there. Um, if there is one place where end users can show up again and, uh, and have a meaningful voice, I think it's on the OpenStack side. So 100% uh, agree. Um, and when you do that and when you bring your voice, it often helps just to talk about what your intent is. The fact that you've done something the same way for 20 years is valuable to know, but really the, the core behind the problem is what we uh, often would like to understand. What is it you're, you're trying to achieve? And with that, uh, we can uh, hopefully build a better networking uh, industry going forward. Okay, so, so one, of the, one of the questions, and I do urge you in the audience, go up to mics if you would like to um, uh, ask your own question here, is that as, as OpenStack gains in popularity and becomes more and more widespread, the number of use cases starts to multiply. And so I actually, think we are seeing very large you know, distinctions between someone trying to do an enterprise cloud on-premise or whatever versus a telco that's, that's interested in network function virtualization. Does, can we accommodate all that in one project such as Neutron or do, we, or do you anticipate seeing this break out into, into several different areas to cover the different use cases? Yes. No, seriously, I, my, my background is in Linux, and if you look at what we've done in, the, in Linux, where we have taken a group of developers who can, uh, are building the Linux kernel and, and operating system around that, that scales from the phone in your pocket to running Wall Street exchanges to all the Fortune 1000 enterprise data centers, it's not a stretch of the imagination, in my opinion, to see Neutron f uh, fitting into that same uh, kind of profile for n networking services in, in OpenStack. And it does start with some core sanity uh, and, and the ability to listen to what users need to do and, and not be too far off on just pushing uh, like a vendor driven uh, agenda, but really listening to how users want to deploy and manage their networking portion of their infrastructures. So I think it's 100% possible, scale up, scale down. It, it, we've seen it happen in, in other parts of the industry. So. Uh, I'm still optimistic that we can really make positive change with, with Neutron. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think that infrastructures start to become more similar. Um, same way of deploying inside of AWS uh, is now possible inside of enterprises. Uh, network function virtualization, the platform running all of that will be some form of a, some form of a cloud uh, service chain together and that same service chaining is necessary whether or not you run it locally uh, or remotely. So. Um, I think that the key thing to solve though, uh, one, uh, certainly stability, but two, um, it's easy to forget, and I, I'll, I'll be a broken record here, but it's easy to forget what the intent is of the infrastructure. The intent is never complexity, the intent is delivering something for the end user. Um, we've got to elevate that, because otherwise we're going to be mired in, in minutia and CLI level details. Uh, we really want to you know, step, step up there. Right, and I think the other thing about use cases is it's, it's a way to keep honest, right? Because it's so easy for a lot of people who are in the development side to say, it looks like a very clean set of APIs, it looks like everything is orthogonal and, and let's go with it, but you really need to go and deal with use cases from the beginning so you have a, a good set, a rich set of use cases that you want to always check your designs against. So as long as you're really Going back to the use cases from the beginning, it's a good way to keep not only the, the vendors happy, but obviously the uh, end users happy as well. And the other important thing is, uh, for example, make sure that's in your design process so that even when you're designing the blueprints and such to keep the use cases in mind. So some of the work that we've been involved in, like in a group policy project, the, the use case documents were really done early on. So I think that's a, a good way to go as well. And, and also going back to the case about NFV, uh, Neutron has continued to involve including uh, service insertion and firewalls and such. So there are some elements to NFV that are outside its domain, but Neutron is evolving to create a really good foundation for NFV. Yeah, I think it's worth, it's worth pointing out that, that there are differences in these things, uh, Lou, like you had brought up, 
However, there's a lot of similarities as well. I think we tend to focus on the differences between NFV, between private cloud, between public cloud, but there, it turns out there actually is a lot of overlap in these use cases as well. I mean, in the NFV case, you need a platform to actually run the infrastructure components that you're launching. So that's where something like OpenStack, uh, the broad OpenStack comes into play, I think, so. Yeah, then, then I would only ask that I would basically as PTLO and for the rest of the contributors, let's document those use cases. Uh, we need more written material for our users to understand if what from what they're trying to do, here's the path that they should be taking with Neutron. We're expanding the possibilities here, but we, I think, are very lagging behind in terms of the technical briefs, white papers, everything associated with how you actually then d then deploy uh, Neutron for, for a real objective here. Uh, yeah, we have a question here. Yes. Introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, my name is Anis Sheikh. I work at Google. Uh, I had a question. This is the future of uh, OpenStack networking. So one of the questions that came up at the last summit that uh, was interesting is this question about how much function we actually put into OpenStack's networking stack versus keeping it as uh, keeping OpenStack networking focused on APIs that expose capabilities and then really letting plugins and various backends provide the functionality. So um, I didn't see that there was a lot of consensus last time. Um, I'm just wondering if you think that any, you all being you know, very involved in the project, think that any consensus is emerging and where you think we ought to be going on that. Yeah. So, Go ahead. So, so actually that, that's a really good question. I, I think what you're going to see happening is you're going to see innovation happening on both angles for that. So for instance, you're going to see open source uh, and proprietary controller platforms like Open Daylight or Open Contrail continue to innovate as well, and you're going to see some abstractions move there. You're going to see those things possibly implement uh, things like service chaining or even L3 routing and things like that. On the flip side, you're also seeing innovation in the core Neutron plugins as well, the ML2 plugin with the Open vSwitch and the Linux bridge agents. Uh, there's, there's actually work going on in Juno to do distributed virtual router functionality. Um, there's also uh, the, the folks working on the L2 population support are doing some great things with, with uh, overlay networking as well. So I, I think the reality is you're going to see innovation in both of those areas going forward. Yeah, this is not a, unfortunately it's not a revolution as a startup on, on this panel here. I'd like to see uh, some of the traditional technologies kind of uh, leave them at the area where they have to be. Uh, but sort of newer greenfield portions of your data center that you're building out with a cloud infrastructure. Let's use SDN, let's use group-based policy for that kind of stuff. But the reality is you're going to have to support um, sort of a brown edge around that greenfield. Uh, and that's um, unfortunately a reality. Uh, the question is, should we spend most of our time recreating what we already had in the past, uh, or should we move forward to more sort of policy-driven um, orchestration down below, and uh, I would like to see more involvement on the policy side, uh, simply because we have already done all the other stuff 20 years ago, um, and uh, up to now. So I'd, I'd like to see more investment in the new, but the reality is we're going to have to work on some of the old stuff as well. Yeah, actually, Chris, if you might address, because I think all along what we've been trying to do is to have Neutron re be responsible for the abstractions and the abstractions that make sense then to a user calling the APIs, and then let implementations actually defer to a lower level or, or anything else, controllers and things like that. Are, are we able to maintain that as we move into services and integrating and stitching together services? Is it sufficient for us to remain just really at the abstraction level and defer the operational implementation to, to plugins and drivers? Well, I mean, it really depends on how we're defining these abstractions. If we look at Networking today, we've started off with a very simple set of primitives which reflect historical uh, views of networking. And service insertion is, the, is sort of this uh, beginning to try to tip in a, a slightly different direction, but we're still um, tethered to, we put the service in a particular spot in, a, in the network or in a particular path in the network. Uh, and I've been concerned that in, in the Neutron side, we're slowly building an SDN controller uh, within Neutron, while at the same time SDN controllers are evolving outside of Neutron. And I think it would be really interesting to look at that and look at where there's value in, 
in maintaining just uh, the API and, and abstraction view within Neutron and where there's value in uh, trying to bring more core functionality into Neutron. And uh, when I first was looking at Quantum, I felt like the right thing to do was put more and more fun core functionality into Quantum. Um, as we've evolved and as the industry's evolved, I've actually come around and I feel like there's, there's more value in keeping high level abstractions. I mean, if you look at Nova, it's not really a hypervisor. It doesn't even have some of the low level management infrastructure like Libvirt. It's really maintaining the, the higher level interfaces and then enough logic to make that uh, coherent and sane. And I, I think we could do something similar in, in Neutron. Okay, and I do want to add that I think innovation or work rather has to happen on both ends because obviously, Wow. <laughs> I think you're not clapping for me, right? <laughs> so I, but anyhow, uh, where was I? Yeah, innovation happens to happen on, um, on both sides as well. So there's also an issue of just parity with Nova networking as well. So that's kind of a, a, a sticky point as well where we have to get those things that done. That has to be achieved. That has to be achieved, right? So we can't look completely on the, the high end. I mean, uh, policy work is extremely important. It's the way to innovate, but let's also not forget about parity so that we could just move forward with the basics. So, so Jeff? Yep. So Jeff Arnold, the Cisco cloud service is not the technology part, the building a cloud part. Can I put a plea into all of the technology vendors here that are working on contributing to, 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 to net, networking in OpenStack? Don't forget the metrics, the solometer uh, metrics, the alarms, the, the log, all of the stuff which so far has been woefully inadequate. And when it comes to people trying to build clouds and actually make money out of them by creating billing models and so forth, right now we have nowhere near enough data to do a good job. So that's been a real... That's a real gap right now in, in the, in the, in the, uh, the OpenStack networking and also in storage as well. But don't, please, please, more metrics, more, more, uh, more, more visibility into the behavior of the system. Uh, that raises a good, so whose responsibility is that? So when we say we want actually heat to be able to orchestrate networking or a salometer to be able to, is it really the responsibility of the Neutron team to make those things happen or do we have to form the collaboration with the other projects? Right. I, I think that's an example of collaboration across the projects as well, which is, which is something that, that, that is good. I think it's healthy for the whole OpenStack e ecosystem, and we need to make sure that, that the projects are, are coordinating across for things like that. Because like Jeff was saying, something like billing, you know, we, need, we need to make sure that, that Solometer is providing the right infrastructure and that we're utilizing that infrastructure to provide the right data so the operators can, can make money, like Jeff said. And I think this is one of those examples where um, networking traditionally was in a silo, uh, in more of the flexible infrastructures, cloud infrastructures, that uh, siloization is going to move away, those barriers are going to move away, so almost naturally uh, project teams here will have to work together uh, to get that inf uh, information out of networking. Um, so part of that is, I guess, also um, the willingness to go across that boundary, meaning uh, abstractions will have to give information back in a useful manner. If if you can insert a high-level policy object that says, create me this three-tier network, and the stats you're going to get back are still on a VLAN on a port basis, then uh, you've basically done half the job, if, if not less. Um, so there is a lot of work that still has to happen on that front. I, I agree. Yeah. And one more thing to add is, when you're at a high-level abstraction layer, you sometimes forget the, the fact that the networking is still running on metal, the real networks, right? So the question is, if you want to understand better physical networking issues, whether it's things like QoS, traffic steering, how can that be properly dealt with? And I think that's more of an area of vendor innovation as well. It doesn't necessarily live at the tenant level, but those things have to be addressed to really let the operators and the people who run the infrastructure, infrastructure itself to understand how to provide a better service for the tenants. Uh, next question here. Hi, um, this is Ram Kumar Gauri Shankar from uh, Extreme Networks. So I had a question about neutron uh, scalability. So uh, I'm not sure if Havana or Icehouse know how moved towards this concept of cells and uh, to enable aggregation and scaling uh, through you know multi-layer cells that report to each other and and build on top of it. But I have not heard anything about neutron support for it or how neutron plugs into such an architecture, whether it still runs at the top level 
and if so how does it scale or does it run at each individual node level in which case how do the apis get exposed and how do they interact with each other is that something that's going to be addressed in in the future roadmap or is neutron scalability going to be addressed in a completely different way uh, i could try something here so if you're talking about scalability it again is an area of vendor innovation itself. I think Neutron per se may not address that. Certainly the default implementations have a lot of, um, uh, I would say, shortcomings in terms of single points of failure, for example. But like the product that we have, um, Midonet actually has a distributed architecture where you don't have a single point of failure because the equivalent of a controller doesn't exist. So rather than a centralized controller, the intelligence is distributed on each of the hosts. So uh, not only for us, but there are a lot of other vendors who could enable that form of innovation at the vendor level. So um, I think that's one way to do it. So, so at, and, and, at the, and at the Neutron level, one of the things that we're but we're looking at possibly in Juno or beyond, there's actually a design summit session around refactoring the Neutron core. And one of the things that we're, that we're potentially looking at there is, um, you know, how, how can we make it so you can scale this by running multiple API servers, for example, behind just a normal load balancer, and you can scale things that way. Right now we're using, we're using a eventlet for, for threading inside there. Maybe it's possible we move to single threaded API servers. And so there, there's discussions around things like this. And I think that certainly this is something we'd like to try to address in the Juno timeframe. Yeah, sort of lastly, I think um, just sheer networking scale. Uh, we've got open daylight on one end, trying to address some of that as well. Um, you know, it's, it's far from, in my opinion, it's far from actually being run in production. So I'd say Neutron is in a better state than, uh, uh, than where the initial release of Open Daylight is. Um, but it certainly has a lot of the momentum behind it. So from a scale perspective, um, uh, I'm expecting a lot to, to also come out of uh, Open Daylight in, in terms of actual raw scale and uh, ability to run virtual networks and interface with them. I know there's going to be other, other talks on this um, during the, the summit here, but uh, people are now talking about policy-driven ways of, of looking at networking. So rather than having to have the user create a three-tier network and, and stitch together these services, they can express policy. It might be good for us to, on this panel, just give some, some view, explain where that's coming from so that people start to get educated about what, what the thinking is behind that. So, so I'll take a first crack at this. So, so I was... I was actually on a panel last fall as well at LinuxCon around this, uh, uh, some of this. And one of the interesting things is, if you look at network controllers today, wh what do they look like, right? They provide common abstractions for networking interfaces. And if you ask yourself why, it's because networking people design those. So we're still talking about things like ports and subnets and routers and things like this. So the, the work you're alluding to, I think, is the group-based policy work which is going on in both Open Daylight and OpenStack, where we're trying to, to change the paradigm for application developers. So they don't have to think in terms of common networking elements, which they may not understand or may not want to understand. And instead, they can think of terms of connectivity and abstraction like that. So I think we're trying to move things forward in, in that direction by providing a new set of APIs. I, I'd say right now we're in a, in a situation where the, the primitives that we're giving application developers are user hostile primitives. You have to become a network engineer to deploy an application, and that really makes no sense when the whole purpose here is to enable quick application deployments. So the, the focus of, of group policy or, or a higher level abstraction is to put the, the application developer back in charge and, and really try to recognize the basic things that you're trying to do as an app developer is create connectivity between different portions of your application. And it's really that simple. And exposing that in network engineering terms makes sense to all the network engineers that are designing the system, but it's just an impedance mismatch to the actual users or developers trying to ride on top of this. Yeah. And I would say that it's just a natural evolution. If you look at other parts in computer science, people have always done things in a more like imperative way in databases. You were in the old days, people are looking at exactly you know which tables to look at and, and which field. But eventually you had higher level query languages that sort of took people away to being more app centric. So this is more of a natural evolution of any field, and I think it really belongs in the, the evolution of networking as well. So I just add uh, sort of two things. One, um, a lot of what the network ought to do is already known outside of networking, meaning if you deploy a heat template, you kind of already know what the relationship is. Um, so on one end, there's a lot of stuff that we don't have to re-implement if we have a policy-driven way. Um, and second, it allows us to get the network out of the way. Um, the information is partially there, add a policy construct to it, add the right level of orchestration to it, um, 
give those tools directly to the software developers and deploy it um, on your own private cloud in the same way as you would deploy it on AWS instances, uh, OpenShift, you know, you name it. Um, and it's, it's that simple. You get out of the way and use the information that's already out there. Can, can someone give me examples of policies? We, 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 that's a big term. What practically, what would be the kind of policies you think that, would, that an end user would care about and be able to express with this? First simple example, um, this storage device or this cluster of storage nodes will have to interact with these sets of backend servers. That relationship is being put in place already in other places. Give it some special treatment. As simple as that. And the fact that that employs VLANs and ports underneath and some level of path diversity, some level of capacity management is kind of, um, is automatically derived from that higher level policy that says there is a relationship. Um, and that can naturally evolve to slightly more complex things where this group of front ends exposes sets of uh, web services. I want to publish that, those and have other people use that um, in the way I've defined it. Or it could even be things that are extremely system operator specific, like even time of day between, let's say, uh, 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. I want to have these policies applied because that's when uh, backup is running or it's not running. So you could really try to map policies into the way uh, a system manager or even a DevOps person would think about. So don't think in terms of what a network engineer or a network manager thinks about. Think in terms of what the tenant or the uh, higher level management of the systems would think about how to apply their policies to the networks. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right where y you have an, a multi-tiered application and one of the reasons that you do something like put one tier in one subnet and another tier in another subnet is not so much about subnetting and it's more about where you apply something like security policy so it creates a policy, security policy boundary. Uh, if we can express that without going down to the granularity of ports and subnets, we've, we've made something that's more consumable for application developers, which is, again, that's, that's what we're trying to support here. And what's, I think what's really exciting is the policy uh, is not just um, here in Neutron or here in some of the projects, but in also uh, some of the other projects for, uh, for storage uh, or for another project called Congress where uh, they're taking a much broader look at, hey, what is my overarching policy across that infrastructure uh, of both compute storage and the applications? You know, minimum version for MySQL should be X. Um, those kinds of policies can be easily combined with, uh, with an infrastructure that supports being spoken to in policy. Uh, they're not necessarily the same, but they ultimately boil down to or help us get to a point where in the abstract you can read, okay, this was the intent, three-tier application, uh, it's a dev environment, and by the way, these minimum corporate requirements have to be met. Uh, that's, I believe, the, the fun thing that can go out, um, we'll end up with. Great, great, great. Uh, next question here. Hi, my name is, <clears throat> wow. My name's John Bacci, I'm from Bank of America, and uh, I'm interested about the silo part of it. I, I came from a networking background, right, and then I moved into storage and did about six or seven years over there, and now I've been doing cloud kind of things. And when you talked about the silos, I'm interested to know at what point, like I don't want to build a three-tier network. I don't want to configure BGP anymore. Now I'm on the server side of the world. When are you guys going to turn Neutron over to me? So I can just do my firewalls and my load balancing when I build servers. You were talking about the server side. I'm trying to figure out where it becomes a project that's in the network silo, because frankly, all the network people are in this room, right? All the server people are right next door. So we're still hanging out in our silos. I'd like to know what's going to happen there, where we're able to collaborate with you guys without, again, how do you, it, I hope I phrased my question well. I'm just trying to say, how can I do the things that I want to do because there's a whole heck of a lot of stuff that you do that I don't care about anymore. And where does that collaboration come together, do you see? Uh, I, I mean, one of the issues we have is just the beginning build out of a deployment. So how do you, how do you bootstrap this whole system? Networking is key to that. The, the services need to talk to each other. Com, uh, compute nodes need to be on specific networks. And uh, we, you know, we're looking at how can you do this with, with modern tools so that you're thinking in terms of deploying a, 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 bare, a bare metal rack, start with, start with nothing, and bootstrap the whole system, say, uh, you know, populating control nodes in the right spot and turning on the network interfaces in the compute nodes so that they show up on the right networks. That's the beginning of sort of breaking down some of these silos. And then as a, as a user, I, ideally we don't, you know, we're, 
we're seeing these as compute storage network. It's a set of APIs, so we don't have that same siloed approach. But on the on the infrastructure management operator side, uh, breaking down some of these barriers and having you know the the ability to bootstrap this system from scratch, I think, is starting to touch on that. And you see, you know. Differing vendors already have integrations with configuration management tools for their physical switching gear. Uh, we can start to treat these things more, more like servers already uh, and use common infrastructure for managing the infrastructure, whether it's a server box, storage array, networking switch. I mean, uh, that to me is the really exciting part where we're, yeah. we are actually moving forward. And part of what I was trying to say is just, just that piece where, you know, where do you give over a subset of commands to the folks in the server world, right? I want you to have all your stuff, and I don't, I don't want to be able to mess up your BGP routes, right? Or add any routers to, or other external connections and other things you're going to be able to do with the tool. Yeah. That's kind of where I so am. That, so that's actually an interesting point because this maybe gets to something that, that we don't talk about much in the OpenStack world. We, we talk about the separation of tenants from, from operators, but I think what you're referring to now is the segregation of, of the responsibilities on the operator side. You may have a storage admin, a network admin, or a server admin or something. Is that, that's kind of where you're headed and you want to make sure that those well, I build are. a server today and I can do certain things, got lots of automation and things are really cool, but it would really be nice to have all the rules in SDN to say who can talk to who, right? There's things like PCI out there that make that exciting and there's a lot of things going on that I need to be able to do things when I'm building servers that touch the network and there's kind of a wall there that I'm trying to, to, to okay. get across. Well, so, I mean, so you work for a bank, so I'm sure you're thinking about a lot of regulatory compliance or some things that, those well, are no, things that just, really drive you, right? Not necessarily. I'm just thinking about most servers. If I think of my network, I need a port. I might need a load balance rule. Right. I might need some firewalls. Right. Those are the three things as a server guy that I should be standing in the other room. Those are really the only three things I care about. So I want to be able to make sure I can touch your stuff mm -hmm. that's being built and do the automation without stepping on your toes. Okay. So so I, think, well, I think actually if, if uh, I want to move on from this point, yeah, but okay. I think that a lot of that was already there in that was the first sort of generation of Neutron, which was to be able to provide network ports, subnets, and attach virtual machines to that programmatically through an API so that the, the developers don't, that is done for them by the, by the Neutron service. Now what you're hearing actually is now we're saying, let's go one step further. What you're really trying to accomplish is capture the intent of this set of servers needs to talk to this set of servers under the following conditions. And that's where I think it'd be interesting for you to uh, um, sort of watch for the evolution now of this policy-driven approach where that now you don't even, developers don't even have to now worry about ports and networks. Instead, they can talk about their intent. Uh, but Thank I wanted to appreciate. get to the last question because we have only about three minutes left here, so. Uh, hi, I'm Joe Harrison. I'm from CERN. Um, going briefly back to the issue of scalability, um, do you not think it's important, instead of relying on vendors for this sort of thing, for the scalability, to actually make sure that there's a reference scalable open source implementation that's completely vendor agnostic? For example, we don't have a homogenous networking environment. We can't just choose one networking vendor. We don't have the budget for it. So do you not think it's important that we implement things in such a way that it's scalable across vendors or even without any specific vendors? No, no absolutely. And that, that was the point that I was making was that, you know, Absolutely, we're, that's the goal for Juno is to come up with a, a scalable open source reference implementation uh, of Neutron that people can deploy at scale. So, so definitely that's, you know, as PTL, that's, that's one of the things that, that we're going to accomplish uh, during the Juno cycle. And sort of just to, to add to that, as a, as a vendor, that's music to my ears as well because as soon as the market says your scalable reference implementation for CERN is you know, a 10 million of something, then immediately it makes the budget discussions internally so much easier to say, hey, you know, the open source thing can do X and ours does Y. You know, there's a delta, we need to fix it. So um, all for it. Um, Richard Stern with Walmart e-commerce. A couple prior topics. I think Neutron is still siloed in its intent and its, its approach. In short, there's a lot of stuff in the existing enterprise infrastructure, not in the cloud, that the cloud has to get to. And talking about routing and subnetting and all that good stuff, it fails. Primarily around ad, um, padding and natting, it doesn't scale at all. I have tons of VMs that need to get this stuff in the enterprise, outside the cloud. 
and there's a total failure there. It's a big disconnect. So my point being, there needs to be either a policy along with a core implementation that says for this class of traffic or servers, whatever makes sense, allow this to be optimized in Neutron to avoid the bottleneck of the address translation. In essence, padding or something that looks like pad. And that's a core routing topic where it just falls flat. Okay, so, so for example, like one of the things that we've done was created a, a VXLine gateway so that there's some workloads that cannot be virtualized, for example, or would not run within OpenStack. So you want to make sure those workloads communicate well within the VMs within your OpenStack cloud. Is that what you're looking at? Or more for performance reasons as well? Uh, very simple. Lots of apps that have to talk to databases right. that are bare metal, right. that are not in the cloud. Right. So all of these apps in the cloud have to initiate traffic to all of the middleware, all of the databases. So in the native implementation, it has to go through the NAT layer, which turns into a big choke point right there, right. let alone latency and the usual routing, you know, network stuff like that. So it's a huge impediment. And I'd argue that Neutron has put itself into a silo. The well, I think, uh, let me characterize it, I think that Neut because it's about networking, it's larger than OpenStack. It has to be able to talk to things outside of OpenStack. Whereas if you look at a lot of the other projects within OpenStack, it can be in within, you know, setting up the virtual machines just within the domain managed by OpenStack. But networking has a special requirement that it has to be able to address connectivity to things that are outside of the, what is being governed by OpenStack. Exactly. I think that's be, very well taken. Exactly. It's like an attitude issue. Right. Think of you're playing not just in the cloud, where this is simple, simple routing, so on and so and all that, but outside, you're in a larger scope to your very point. That's great. Um, unfortunately, we've got to cut it off at this point so that you can get on to the other sessions as well. So thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you at the rest of the conference.